Hi everyone, welcome to He Walks With Us Everywhere. I'm Tracy, and today I wanted to just kind of talk to y'all about something that's been on my mind and on my heart for almost a week now. And so I just, I'll start with a prayer. You know, Father, I ask that you give me the discernment and the wisdom that I need to convey the message that you've placed on my heart so heavily. Um, let me not sit in judgment of others, Father, but let me illuminate your words and your truth and may it be for life to those who listen. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. So let me start out by reading, um, reading this to y'all. Do not listen, this is from Jeremiah 23, um, 16 through about 23. So do not listen to what the prophets are prophesying to you. They fill you with false hopes. They speak visions from their own minds, not from the mouth of the Lord. They keep saying to those who despise me, the Lord says, you will have peace. And to all who follow the stubbornness of their hearts, they say, no harm will come to you. But which of them has stood in the counsel of the Lord to see or hear his word? Who has listened and heard his word? See, the storm of the Lord will burst out in wrath, a whirlwind swirling down on the heads of the wicked. The anger of the Lord will not turn back until he fully accomplishes the purposes of his heart. In days to come, you will understand it clearly. I did not send these prophets, yet they have run with their message. I did not speak to them, yet they have prophesied. But if they had stood in my counsel, they would have proclaimed my words to my people and would have turned them from their evil ways and from their evil deeds. Um, so turned them from their evil ways and from their evil deeds. What that to me is saying is is a message of repentance. I mean, it is what is Jesus's message throughout Scripture. It's what John's message has been. It's what you know Jonah and Nineveh's message. It's the message of the Lord, which is it, it has always been and will always be to repent of our wicked and evil ways and to turn back into the Lord, or perhaps to turn to Him for the very first time. And so what prompted all of this in me was a sermon, um, well, church service on Sunday. So this past Sunday, my daughter and I went to another church service at an undisclosed church in, a, in, in the big city that we're in right now. And, you know, we've been there before and, you know, there's not, it's not that it's all bad. And I'm sure that there are, you know, many true believers there and, and those who love the Lord with all their heart. But like anywhere, there are many false prophets. There are many lukewarm in their faith, which I too was once lukewarm in my faith. And, you know, there's, there's a softness in the message. There's this, um, you know, there's, there's this great hope and this great mercy and this great grace, which are not bad things. However, it's dangerous for, for Christians. It's dangerous for true Christ followers as well as for the unredeemed. And the reason for that is because if we're not being preached to this message about repentance and the need for conviction in our hearts, if we're not convicted, it's, it's all for naught. You know, as far as I'm concerned, I'm, I'm one person who I don't have a really big following anywhere. I'm not, you know, prolific with society. I'm not a person of influence. I'm not a mighty woman of valor, you know, I'm, I'm nobody. And so, but I know that the Lord has given me a message to share with everybody I run into. I mean, everybody and whatever platform that is, whether it's on YouTube or face to face, whether it's at church churches or supermarkets, you know, this message for a need to repent, a need to make a choice, you know, a conscious decision, which conscience it's two part. Con means with, and science means knowledge. So it's with knowledge. We're making a, a, a choice based off of fact, based off of wisdom, based off of the scriptures that have been written on all of our hearts to consciously turn away from our sin, from the things that displease God, from the things that are wrong in his eyes. And he is the one who gives us the basis between what's right and what's wrong. Without God, without his commandments, we have no knowledge of what's right and what's wrong. And so to go into a church service where it's this soft message of, you know, everybody's good and, you know, there's all this hope and, and, and peace and joy and love, 
while it feels good, you know, that, that plays on my fleshy desires, it, it's a feeling. And we all know feelings change and they can change rapidly day to day. And so when I go to church, I'm going there and we all should be going there to be fed the word of God. Like this is why we walk into a church building. It is not for the camaraderie. It is not to see who has the best outfit on that Sunday. It's not to make ourselves known among all the people as being a worker of good or a great volunteer. We don't go into the church to make ourselves look good or to, oh, you know, they were a great person because they went to church every Sunday. We go because we need to be fed the word of God. We need to be fed with truth and with power, and the power comes from the, the word of God itself. You know, Jesus came to the world to bring a sword. He, he said that. He said, I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. And he said, when you choose to follow me, the world's going to hate you. You know, if it hated me, it will surely hate the ones who follow after him. Um, he was without sin. He was perfect. He didn't, you know, create uh, rifts between people because of a sinful fallen nature. He spoke boldly the commandments. You know, I, I, I wanted to read another part of the scripture. It says in Ezekiel 13, uh, 8 through 9, Therefore, this is what the sovereign Lord says. Because of your false words and lying visions, I am against you, declares the Sovereign Lord. My hand will be against the prophets who see false visions and utter lying divinations. They will not belong to the council of my people or be listened in the records of Israel, nor will they enter the land of Israel. Then you will know that I am the Sovereign Lord. You know, again, it's talking about false teachers. And, you know, we're told that many will come in the end days. Many will come um, professing to be speakers for the Lord, for the kingdom of God, and that we need to discern by the Holy Spirit what is from God and what isn't. And so this, this church service we walk into, it was, you know, it was praise and worship to start with and in more of a whisper than, than the power of the Holy Spirit in that place. Again, you know, it's this, they profess me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. And that's what I feel, and that's what I gather, and that is what the Holy Spirit puts within me when I have entered some of the churches that I've been to over the past year while being on the road for Christ. And, and this was no different. And, you know, I, I, I sat through the, the praise and worship, or I, I praised and worshiped God, and I, and I kept praying, you know, God, I'm here to, to celebrate you. I'm here to glorify you. I'm here to give you honor to keep me out of judgment or that that condemnation in, in which we're all, you know, so easily tempted towards, you know, that we're somehow better or different or special or whatever the case is. And so I, I checked myself a lot, you know, like, God, I don't want to be judgmental. So just show me, you know, make it clear. And sure enough, you know, the sermon opens up and the whole sermon was going to be about this vision that the church had years ago, what it wanted to look like by the year 2020. And so that set up this entire sermon, this entire hour or however long they have or they give or you know feel like people will listen to them, talking about their, their accomplishments, talking about you know the, the good works that they had done and the the great things that they'd accomplished over the course of X amount of years. And I sat there with this, I just, it, the righteous indignation I felt within my spirit just kept growing and growing. And like I said, I'm nobody of influence, but I know I have a message to give. I know what the Lord told me. I know he told me to share this with everybody. And, and I have no platform. You know, this is my platform, YouTube. That, that is the most people I could reach at a single given time. And, and yet, here in these pulpits across America, across the world, are pastors, preachers, leaders, overseers who have such a blessing. Like, they don't even see it. Look at, look at how many lives they can reach in, in a single hour. Look at how many people they can speak to and capture the attention of. And it's like it's being wasted. And it made me so upset like so upset because 
they have a responsibility. If you're going to be an overseer, it's a, it's a noble task. And, you know, you need to be above reproach and you need to warn your congregants. Like, that's your job. Your job isn't to make their life, you know, oh, everything's good and, you know, life is better with Jesus. You know what? That's not necessarily true. And according to scripture, in fact, it's not true. That's a lie. It's a false doctrine that's being taught throughout the U.S. and throughout the world. Like, Jesus never said your life is going to get super easy when you follow me. He said, consider the cost. Consider the cost because the way is narrow. The way is narrow and few are they who find it. He says that you will be persecuted for my sake. You will have tribulations and trials for my sake. He says that the road is in fact not going to be easy. He said it will be riddled with issues and problems and difficulty. So to hear pastors taking this beautiful gift of time that they've been given in front of this beautiful congregation of people, these souls that they're responsible for, and instead they're talking about their accolades and their their visions and you know how much they've they've gotten done over the last however many decades or years or months or weeks it's stealing in my heart it's a form of theft they're stealing well they're stealing time you know from these people because let me just read one more thing to you here well it'll be more than one but Matthew 7, 13. Enter then through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. But small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. I mean, that tells us, right, and these are words in red. These are Jesus' words. He says, it's a narrow gate, right? So right now, all of these mega churches and even little churches are trying to be like the world, right? They're trying to do things the way that the world does them in order to gain a bigger audience, in order to gain more income, more people to come in their doors. Thinking, and, I, and I'm sure that a lot of them do it initially for virtuous reasons, but they're lying. You know, it, it, they're, watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. By their fruit, you will recognize them. Do people pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Likewise, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, by their fruit, you will recognize them. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, we did, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and in your name perform many miracles? Or in your name, did we not feed 15,000 people a year? Or did we not open up homeless shelters or clothing centers? Did we not create youth camps for the children. He says, then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. So to know God is way different. To believe in God is way different than following him. And following him means that we are separate from this world. We look nothing like it. So while the world is out there yelling, execute them, crucify him, murder them, we need to be the ones who stand up and are saying, you know, no, that's not okay. It goes against God's commandments. When they're saying abortion's fine, we need to be the ones rising up saying it's murder, you know, and, and it's not okay in God's eyes or in businesses, right? Oh, it's just a tiny little white lie and, and that's, that's okay. That'll be forgivable or, you know, no, it's not okay. You know, it, it's, it's getting back to the basics, y'all. It's getting back to the, the wisdom of the Lord and the truth in his words. So let's, let's read some more. So then, and this is in Matthew 23. Then Jesus said to the teachers of the law and the Pharisees sit in Moses, and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. So you must be careful to do everything they tell you, but do not do what they do. 
for they do not practice what they preach. They tie up heavy, cumbersome loads and put them on other people's shoulders, but they themselves are not willing to lift a finger to move them. Everything they do is done from people to done for people to see. They make their physicalities wide and the tassels on their garments long. They love the place of honor at banquets and the most important seats in the synagogues. They love to be greeted with respect in the marketplace and be called rabbi by others. But you are not to be called rabbi, for you have one teacher, and you are all brothers. And do not call anyone on earth father, for you have one father, and he is in heaven. Nor are you to be called instructors, for you have one instructor, the Messiah. The greatest among you will be your servants. For those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. And then again in Matthew 24, 24. For false messiahs and false prophets will appear and perform great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. I have told you ahead of time, Jesus' words. And then further on in Matthew 24, 27. For as lightning that comes from the east is visible, even in the west, so will the coming of the Son of Man be. So, you know, again, warnings. Warnings everywhere. There's, um, there's not a whole lot these days that is being taught about obeying God's commandments. It's almost like with the newer churches or the churches of America, and I've seen it in other places as well, but it's, it's almost like the Old Testament doesn't matter anymore. And, and people are only holding on and running with the grace and the mercy in the blood of Jesus, which is important. Absolutely. It's vital. You know, we're told that the only way that we can get to heaven is through the Son. So that's obviously incredibly important, right? But Jesus himself tells us, and this is found in John 14, 23, Jesus replied, anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. My father will love them and we will come to them and make our home with them. Anyone who does not love me will not obey my teaching. These words you hear are not my own. They belong to the father who sent me. So again, you know, here the Lord is telling us, obey, obey, repent, obey. You know, he's saying that you have to turn away from the wickedness and evil things. It's not just about saying, hey, I'm sorry. And then you keep doing the same things over and over and over again. You know, because let's let's think about this on a, a very human level for a minute, okay? So if somebody punches you in the face and they say, oh, I'm sorry, you know, the first time, I, I can see where maybe somebody would be like, hey, it's all right, you know, let's get let's get through it. That really hurt. Don't ever do it again. Okay. You know, now here it comes again. Same, same thing happens the second day, punch you in the face. And they're like, Oh, Hey, I'm sorry. I'm really sorry. And you're like, are you going to be okay with it? What about the third time, fourth time, fifth time? You know, let's say we're, we're now in the seven day stretch a week, every day for a week, the same person has come up to you and taken a swing at you to punch you in the face. And every single time they're saying, oh, I'm sorry, oops, you know, I'm sorry, my bad, oops. At some point in time, you're gonna stop believing that their apology is sincere. And at some point in time, their apology isn't sincere, you know, because somebody who's really sorry about doing something that's harmful or hurtful or abusive or violent or anything, they're gonna stop doing it, right? they're not gonna to continue to do it. If I continue to punch somebody in the face, then I'm not sorry about punching them in the face. It's common sense, it's logic. Well, the same thing is true with scripture. The same thing is true with the holy commandments. You know, I can't say that I love God, and that I love his son, Jesus, God in the flesh who walked among us. I cannot say that I love him and then go out there and continually break his commandments repeatedly and just, say, oh, well, you know, God's grace covers it. Jesus's blood covers it. it. It does cover it to a genuine, repentant person. So am I genuinely repentant for things that I've done in my life? Oh, absolutely. You know, 
but I'm not gonna keep doing the same exact things that initially led me to that need for conviction in my heart and repentance in my life if I really love God and I love his words. And that's the other thing is like we realize that God's words and his commandments are for us. They're not against us. They're not trying to like stifle us or hold us back or anything. They're there to give us life and that more abundantly. Let me continue on here. So here's what I'm talking about with pastors, right? Having this incredible responsibility to their their flock. I mean, it's like a shepherd in the field, right? And he's got a hundred sheep out there. His job is to care for every single one of them, like that none of them should perish. Now we cannot be good shepherds because there is only one good, but we should keep watch over them and teach them the Lord's ways and stand in conviction and stand up, you know, in the pulpit on Sunday mornings or Wednesday nights, or whenever it is, Saturdays, when you have this platform that the Lord has blessed you with, and share the true message of the gospel of Christ. Like, why are they standing up there talking about soft, lovey, fluffy stuff? Why are they talking about all of these good works that they've accomplished, you know, through the Lord and through his people, when what they need is conviction? You want a world to change? Convict men and women's hearts. You want a world to change? Show them the commandments of the Lord and, and speak the truth about hell. Hell is a very real place. And so many Christians today don't even want to believe it. They don't want to think about it. You know, they, they're wanting to pretend like it's this fairy tale place where hell doesn't exist. Heaven does, you know, for, for good and for the good people and for people who love Jesus. But hell's not really a place. This is what some of these places are pastoring, preaching, what they're sharing, or at least what they're with knowledge, withholding from their congregants. Hell is a real place. Jesus talks about hell. He talks about the lake of fire. He talks about burning eternally. It is a darkest of dark. It's not just eternal separation from God. Like that in and of itself terrifies me, right? But for somebody who doesn't know the love of God, what do they, what do they have to be afraid of? You know, being separated for, from a God that they don't even know isn't going to convict their hearts. What will convict their hearts is, you know, have you lied? Have you stolen? Have you committed adultery or looked with eyes of lust? Have you murdered? And that can be anger towards another brother or sister, right? So murder is not just the physical act of like murdering somebody. It's murder with the tongue, which is, you know, anger, hatred. And so if we're not sharing these truths, it, it makes my heart break and it, it, it angers me because pastors have a responsibility to their congregants and that responsibility is to teach the true word of God, to feed your flock, you know, and they're not doing it. And, and it angers me, like I said, be, in righteous anger because these people are gonna burn in hell because they're not being led by their pastors. They're being softened up, buttered up. They're being treated in the ways that are comforting by the world's standards, and it's all for the sake of acceptance. Like the devil is sneaky, and he's snuck right into our churches and stolen away our pastors and stolen away the message, soft coated it, made it seem like, oh, well, if you can get like a bunch of numbers in here, you know, then uh, then there's a way to like convert these people. And it's it's false converts, hundreds, thousands. That's why he says narrow is the road that leads to eternity, narrow. Few are they who find it. He doesn't say bunches and bunches of people are going to find it, y'all. He says few. So when I think of scripture and I think of like the few who followed Christ, 12. 12 disciples, you know? Think about it. How many were around? How many heard him? And how many actually laid it all down to follow him? A few. So let's read in Acts 20. 28. Keep watch over yourselves and all the flock of which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Be shepherds of the church of God, which he bought with his own blood. I know that after I leave, savage wolves will come in among you and will not spare the flock. Even from your own number, men will arise and distort the truth in order to draw away disciples after them. So be on your guard. 
And then, you know, this is also where he says, remember that for three years, three years, I never stopped warning each of you night and day with tears. Like this is conviction. This is a man who knows that there's a hell, who knows that there's a heaven, and he knows that these people's souls are at stake. So there's genuine passion and care. Where is the passion? Where is that passion today? It's not there because false prophets are in the pulpit. And then Romans 12, 5, 12, 2, excuse me. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. I mean, amen. You know, don't conform to the pattern of this world. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Well, the church today is transforming itself into the pattern of the world. Like, let's make it fresh. Let's make it upbeat. Let's make it new. Let's make it, you know, relational. Let's, in, in doing that, they're pulling away from the true word of the Lord. I mean, oh, it just upsets me. Corinthians 7, Corinthians seven nineteen. Circumcision is nothing, and uncircumcision is nothing. Keeping God's commands is what counts. So it doesn't matter, you know, what they're saying here is whether you are like an elect in, in a high place of position or power or authority or you're a pheasant or somebody who is poor and has nothing seemingly to the world, what matters is keeping the commandments of the Lord. That's what matters. That's what counts. And on the day of judgment, that's what's going to count. So let's let's look at this. Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 6, 14. Do not be yoked together with unbelievers. For what do righteousness and wickedness have in common? Or what fellowship can light have with darkness? What harmony is there between Christ and Belial? Or what does a belief believer have in common with an unbeliever? What agreement is there between the temple of God and idols? For we are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will live with them and walk among them. And I will be their God and they will be my people. Therefore, come out from them and be separate, says the Lord. Okay, so coming out from them and be separate means that we look nothing like the world. These pastors today, the preachers, the shepherds who don't want to stand up and speak politically incorrect things because they're worried about running congregants off. You're doing a disservice. I'm talking to you right now. Probably won't even watch, but you're doing a great disservice to your people. You're doing a great disservice to the souls of man. You know, if you're going to sit there and preach that everybody's welcome in the kingdom of God, you're a fool and you're greatly mistaken and you're a false prophet. You know, step up. Speak the word of God. Convict your parishioners to repent. Like that's what this is all about. And the message week after week after week should be essentially coming back to that same message, the same principles. Are you breaking God's commandments? Because if you are and you have not completely repented or turned, like you're going to go to hell. And hell is not a beautiful place. And there's no purgatory or this in-between place. Hell is hell. It is empty. God's grace is not there. There's no light. There's no hope. There's no truth. And yet we're not warning our parishioners. You know, why? Let's see. Just as Janice and Jean Bray's opposed Moses, so also these teachers oppose the truth. 2 Timothy 3. And this is verse 8. And then let's talk about uh, in 2 Timothy 3, verse 13 or 12. In fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ to Jesus will be persecuted. Let me say that again. Everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted while evildoers and imposters will go from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have become convinced of, because you know those 
from whom you learned it, and how from infancy you have known the holy scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. And so then there's, you know, there's just, again, so many verses, so many passages that talk about how pastors are to teach, how they're to lead. You know, Titus, Titus 3, and it's middle of verse 7. In your teaching, show integrity, seriousness, and soundness of speech that cannot be condemned so that those who oppose you may be ashamed because they have nothing bad to say about us. In your teaching, show integrity, seriousness, and soundness of speech. You know, the Lord, we've been given instructions. We've been told how to preach. We've been told how to witness. We've been told how to repent. We've been told what it takes to enter the kingdom of heaven. Nothing is hidden. The mysteries unfold, and he reveals more and more to us as we walk in his ways. I know this video is getting long, so I'll try and wrap it up here, but let's see. There was There's so many more. I mean, I don't know if you can see these bookmarks, but I have a, a good bit of bookmarks in here that I'd like to get to. So false teachers and their destruction. You know, read 2 Peter, like all of it. Read all of 2 Peter. And then let's read 2 Peter at the end of the chapter. Therefore, dear friends, since you have been forewarned, be on your guard so that you may not be carried away by the error of lawless, of lawlessness, excuse me, by the error of the lawless and fall from your secure position but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And then, let's keep reading. Not loving the world. This is found in 1 John 2. And it's verse 15. Do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, love for the Father is not in them. For everything in the world, that's, let's say, everything in the world the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life comes not from the Father, but from the world. And then he also says in 1 John 3, uh, verse 13. So he says, uh, Do not be surprised, my brothers and sisters, if the world hates you. You know, that's just, they, they aren't going to like world isn't going to like what God's people have to say. You know, if you're a pastor and you're watching this, I, I pray that the Holy Spirit is convicting your heart right now because I have such a passion. I would love to stand up and share the message of repentance with hundreds of thousands of people every week. I don't get that. You know, that's not where my position is. And I'm not coveting that. What I'm saying is you have a responsibility and a great blessing count it joy. Like you have this amazing gift to stand and to share and to witness the message of repentance, which is what we're all called to do. Stop preaching fluffy sermons that make us feel good for a Sunday, but leave us empty the rest of the week. Stop giving us messages of grace and salvation through the blood of Christ without preaching the importance of obeying our God and his commandments, right? Because the salvation of the Lord Jesus is not going to get us anywhere if we're breaking every commandment day in and day out, you know, Sunday afternoon through Monday, Sunday morning. You know, it, it's it's just, it's enough. It's enough of the lukewarmness and enough of the, the false teachers out there. I'm sick of it. I had to leave service the other night, the other, excuse me, the other day. I could not sit in it. I couldn't sit because it, it made me, it made me tear up, you know, I couldn't sit there and, and watch this gift, this precious time that they've been given just dwindle away. What if the return of our savior is today? Did your sermon on Sunday do any good for the parishioners, for your congregants, for your visitors, for the guests, for those who don't know Christ, for those who've never heard the word repentance or conviction? Did your message convict hearts? Did you shine like a lamp on a hill? 
did you become hated by the world because you're preaching a message that isn't popular? I'm like that's what the scripture is about. It is not about popularity. It's not about doing what the world thinks is PC or what everybody else thinks is is okay enough, you know, and, and border of being lukewarm and actual Christ following, you know. Be firm in your convictions. Be firm in what you're saying. Speak truth because I'm telling all the pastors and preachers and overseers right now that your, your spirit, your soul is going to be responsible for the blood of thousands. It says that in scripture too. So let's read this final thing and I'll, and I'll close it up here. All right, so here we go. So it's in uh, 1 John 5, 2. This is how we know that we love the children of God by loving God and carrying out his commands. In fact, this is love for God to keep his commands and his commands are not burden burdensome for everyone born of God overcomes the world. So again, talking about the commandments, you know, even in the New Testament. And that's really what me bringing up all of these scripture messages is about. It, I want people to understand the importance of the Old Testament, the importance of the holy commandments of God. And, you know, if, you, if you're not in your Bible, get in your Bible every day. I didn't do that for years, and I became a lukewarm follower, and it almost killed me. Like, my spirit was so close to being dead, y'all, and but for the grace of God, there go I. So I can no longer sit passively by in churches that are preaching lukewarm messages or in churches that are preaching a feel-good Sunday, make the parishioners smile and giggle and walk out of the the con walk out of the church and be empty the rest of the week and not convicted. So I just I'm hoping that this message reaches someone. May it all give God the glory and the honor that He so greatly deserves. And um, stay alert. We're watchmen.